You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class, with me, your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. And this week, I have a very special guest, although I'm not sure the topic is quite right for little ears, but I am joined today by... Baby. Baby, that's right. Baby. And we always say it the way Moira Rose says it, because that's just what you do. So Baby here is my little girl, and you're how old? Seven. You're seven. So we are getting ready for the festive season, because where are we going Disneyland. Disneyland Paris is where we're going. That's absolutely right. My brother's coming too. That's right, Bubba is coming with us. It's not Bubba. Yeah, it is Bubba. It's Bubba. My brother. Your brother is Bubba. He's not heavy. He's your brother. I mean, he is heavy. (laughs) He's so, he's so, he's just pure muscle and bone and his bones are really dense. His bones are really strong. And who is coming with us? My big sister. That's right, your big sister's coming with us. So yeah, we are going on a little family holiday and we're going to go see Mickey and Minnie and Donald and Goofy, maybe Pluto. Um, Who else do you think we're going to see in Disneyland? I think Rapunzel maybe. You think Rapunzel maybe? Yeah, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Tiana one? Is Tiana one? Yeah, Tiana's a princess. And, um, 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 what's her name again? I don't know. Cinderella. That's the one, the one with the tiny feet. Yeah. She's got wee feet. Are you the one with the flying, um, um. Carpet? No. Oh. Flying, um, like flying wizards. The flying wizards? Yeah, the Are we still talking about Disney? <laughs> yeah. There's a flying wizard? There's, there's two, there's like three. There's like. They're little. They're the little ones. They're they're the little ones with the flying wizards. No, no, it's a it's a princess. I forgot the name. Wait, wait, wait. Do you mean do you mean Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I did not know who it was. This is actually a wee change for anybody who usually listens to the show because they're like, "Wow, she hasn't sworn yet. I have to wait for her to fall asleep." It's fine. Or make a cover of yours. So normally, um, this is the part where I give you a warning um, that my language can be colourful. But, um, yeah, that happens sometimes. Um, Even me? Your language colourful? No, you don't get to swear. <laughs> you don't use cuss words. That's not allowed. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. The worst part is, right, she uses them in context which I, part of me feels like is a failing as a parent, but another part of me is like, in context though. <laughs> yes, as well. No. <laughs> yeah, no. Wait, wait, are you saying I'm a failure as a parent or that I'm a good parent? You're a good parent. Okay, then the child is spoken, I win. But um, I know what you no, are. No, I win. <laughs> Excuse me, we have to get to the story. Sorry. So, Sorry, mom. That's right. You saw me. So yeah, we I apologize. Thank you. So uh I would like to thank everybody for their five star reviews. I don't know what happened in the UK, but I am charting in the UK on both Spotify and Apple history charts. Oh yeah, you've got a shocked face now, don't you, kid? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know why I don't know how it is from Apple. Oh yeah. I don't know what that is. Oh you don't know what Apple is? But you know what Spotify is? Yeah, I know yeah. it's part of the music, and I want to listen to you, my guy. I don't think you're allowed to listen to my podcast. Oh, yeah. But anyway, I know what you all are thinking. You're thinking what you're jibber-jabber. In fact, me. In fact, you, I will. But first, we've got to get our source on. Our sources are... Scandal and Betrayal, Shackleton and the Crown Jewels, by Kevin Hannafin and John Kaferke. Vicious Circle, The Case of the Missing Irish Crown Jewels, by Viola Banks and Francis Bamford. 
National Archives of Ireland? That's right, the National Archives of Ireland. The Theft of the Irish Crown Jewels by Thomas O'Riordan. And of course, our old favourites, History.com. Are we sitting comfortably? Good. Then let's begin. So initially, we were going to be talking about, um, I say we, I was going to be talking about a certain female serial killer, or alleged serial killer, but um, seeing as I have a little person here who does not like words like kill or cover your ears. <coughs> Murder. So because that happens, we, uh, we decided to change it up to the theft of the Irish crown jewels. See, no, no, no death in this one. Okay? What is the, the crown jewels? What is the Well, I'm glad you asked because I'll tell you. So the Irish crown jewels, it, it's funny because like they were never actually called the crown jewels like when they were in Dublin Castle. So like when they existed, well, no, they probably still exist, but when they were in existence in Dublin Castle, before they were stolen, they were known not as the Irish Crown Jewels, but instead, uh, they were uh, like a kind of badge, like a fancy badge, because it's called an insignia, right? And it was for the most illustrious order of St. Patrick. Now, this is like, um, mm, how to put this? It's a chivalric order. And you know, like, oh, it's the Order of the Knights Temple and stuff. Kind of like that, but less cool. So what they were is, they were a group of just aristocracy, really. People like to give each other titles and be in groups together. And the jewels would be worn by the leader of the order. The most important person. That is absolutely right. And so they would wear these jewels. Now, the jewels of the most illustrious order of St. Patrick, they consisted of this star and badge regalia, and it was set with Brazilian diamonds, rubies and emeralds. And all these jewels actually came from Queen Charlotte's collection. So yeah, Queen Charlotte married King George, you know, the one from Bridgerton, her stuff. like. And this was, and this insignia, this set of jewels, it was made at the order of William the Fourth, so Charlotte and George's son, and William, being the English sovereign, being the king, he was at the head of the most illustrious order of Saint Patrick. It does sound absolutely pretentious, though, doesn't it? So William, or whoever the leader was at that time, he would wear the jewels at the order's important events. Now, the funniest thing about this order, I say funny, it's not. It's um, it's a members-only club, effectively, and you had to be of the nobility slash aristocracy, and you had to be pro-unionist. So you had to be, you know, pro the crown, you had to be a supporter of British rule in Ireland, and also, quite obviously, the British crown. Now, unlike, you know, the British royal crown jewels, um, the Irish crown jewels, firstly, again, not called the crown jewels during their uh, time of being used, but they were jewels, and they were Irish, and they were owned by the crown. I say Irish, they were in Ireland. And they were owned by the crown. And yeah, yeah, not like worn at coronations or anything that was important like that, but just by this order and their own little, I don't know, fancy little meetings. So like the most illustrious order of St. Patrick, oh God, it's so, it's such a mouthful. And it is so bloody pretentious. It is though, it is. It's the most illustrious order of St. Patrick. Look how we're like really high ranking, but we're like trying to include Irishness in it. Mmm. Yeah, and so it was established in like 1783, basically to keep in good with, you know, the crown. And the jewels were made, uh, crafted in like 1830. 
So step forward about 70 years, just over 70 years, and we are in the early 20th century. So the early 1900s, Ireland was still very much under British rule. And this is sort of pre, sort of the big radical rebellion again. This is pre-Easter Rising, pre all this. It wasn't as extreme. Like, they weren't trying to separate from Britain. Even the most nationalist of people, they were advocating for home rule at this point. So just governing themselves while still being part of the British Empire. But at the turn of the century, conflict was trickling in. It was growing. There was a change in the wind. So through Ireland, there's a lot of cultural revival. There's growth. You know, there's better like telegram systems, postal, radio. People are connecting and word is spreading. Um, in 1904, Gaelica comes back into the school system after being erased for uh, <laughs> so long. Like, the, the, the laws that were imposed as Britain did everywhere that it colonised, it would try and remove and eradicate the indigenous languages of those nations' countries that it would go in and take control of. Then in 1905, the very first iteration of Sinn Féin is established, and also the Ulster Unionist Party is there, and they're on opposite sides of this conflict, with Sinn Féin sort of starting this movement, and then the Ulster Unionist Party basically stockpiling artillery, because they're getting ready for this, this, you know, coming battle. And then in 1905, you see this huge change, because you have the ranch war, which is effectively the sort of the lower classes, um, sort of agriculturally, sort of smallholders, farmers, etc. And they are rebelling against the landlords, because the landlords own all the land, and they were basically screwing people over. I mean, that's why boycotts exist, because of the Irish, which I will cover properly in probably another bitty sort at some point. So there's this huge protest by all of these smaller um, workers and smallholders and they are demanding to own their own land. And when things like that start happening, the concept of independence isn't exactly, you know, a kick in the shirt away. And seeing the signs, even members of parliament, the Irish parliament, who were major landowners, started talking about land reform. Because, you know, it's better to have a little bit of land than no land at all. Because you don't want to lose everything you own and, you know, maybe be uh, attacked, looted, ruined, so on and so forth. And now that we have all of that context, let's get back to the crown jewels. So these are a set of jewels worn by the sovereign, the King of Britain, made from British jewels, but held in Ireland and are part of a uh, Irish order of some kind. Blah, blah, blah. So they're very much a symbol of Ireland being part of Britain. Like, that's it's what they represent. It's what the insignia is, effectively. It's why they chose St. Patrick as the most illustrious blah, 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 blah. That being said... It wouldn't be too much of a stretch to see the Irish crown jewels as a pretty tasty target. So William IV, he commissions the jewels in 1830. And from 1831, so basically a year in, like that's how long it takes to fashion jewels from one thing to another, I guess. So yeah, they were delivered to Dublin in 1831. And so from then until 1903, the jewels were actually held by a jeweler. Now this isn't surprising because I, I just took another look at these, okay? Because somehow I had convinced myself that they were smaller because there was 394 jewels in total, like in this. This was made of 394 jewels, almost 400. That is a fuck ton of jewels. It's a star decorated with Brazilian diamonds 
In the centre, there's an emerald trefoil and a ruby cross on a blue enamel background. Then, a diamond badge and five gold jewel-encrusted collars. Some of them are colourful. They're very colourful and sparkly. Yeah. You know what? Let's remake them. You know, <laughs> let's design our own crown jewels. You want crown jewels? Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. And you know what, baby? These jewels, do you know how much they'd be worth today in today's money? I don't know. Seven million euro. Oh my goodness. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of jewels. Just saying. So because, you know, there's a ton of jewels and it's worth a lot of money, typically the jewels would be housed at West and Sons, which is this prominent Dublin jeweller. And why this particular jeweller? Well, it was the official watchmaker for Queen Victoria. And these jewellers were, in fact, fastidious. So if they had spoons that were sent out to be used by the king and queen, you know, they would count them to make sure that none were missing. So, like, they were very much about security. They were double-locking things. They were on the ball. Now, when the jewels weren't at this jeweller's, they would be transferred to Dublin Castle. And this would usually be for, quote-unquote, castle season, which had all these balls and events and royalty would visit because they would be taken there for, you know, the royals to wear them as and when required. Dublin Castle, pretty busy by the way, because not only was it where, you know, where the government sat, so the government of Ireland for the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, that's where the government sat in Dublin Castle. But also, it was the headquarters of the Dublin Metropolitan Police. So it was full of military, it was full of the police, it had, you know, members of parliament, like, everybody was there. You know, it was not a place that was easy to get into or to take anything from because, again, just all of these, like, authority figures were there. So when the jewels were transferred to Dublin Castle, they were kept in a wall safe. This was in Birmingham's Tower and the safe only had two keys. But they were actually going to be moved to a deeper part of the castle. And where are they getting moved to? Bedford Tower. Bedford Tower. Which is going to be the new office of... Ulster King of Arms. The Ulster King of Arms. Not the Ulster King of Arms, baby, but it's, it's, it's fine. I mean, also, yes. But it's okay. It is okay. Everything's fine. So basically, around 1901, it was decided that the Ulster King of Arms has obviously been moved into Bedford Tower, which Arthur Vickers was quite happy about. Now, he was the Ulster King of Arms. So basically, he was the dude in charge of all the heraldry. So at the turn of the century, especially land, power, you know, all of this was related to family tree. It was all to do with inheritance. So you would need to be able to track that. So, being the Ulster King of Arms, that put Vickers in an incredibly powerful position because he was the one who did the research and was able to tell people, well, you get this and you get that, or no, you're not allowed to have this, etc., etc. And so he was the one who would say if you were the heir to the estate or you were the legitimate heir, you know, if you carried the title. Or if Jimmy over there carried the title. And who would get the money? So yeah, he was in a good position. Unfortunately for Arthur Vickers, another important part of this job was to be in charge of the Irish Crown Jewels, as they would soon be known. Now he wasn't really keen on this part, but he liked the rest of his job. So yeah, I mean... I mean, as a quid pro quo, it's not that bad. He gets power, he gets a seat at Parliament, and he gets a lovely apartment at Dublin Castle, and a lot of money and respect. So when he gets told that the jewels have to be moved to a deeper part of the castle, he's like, great, I deserve a free place to live, 
and also that the jewel should be kept in a safe inside a special strong room. Now it was an important job, but not that important that the board of works at Dublin Castle were going to give him free board. But they did like his super cool strong room idea, which I think was just an excuse for him to not have to deal with the jewels as often. And yeah, this is where things get a little bit farcical. Now, anyone who knows me knows I love a farce and I love a heist, and this has both. So they're thinking we need to get this strong room all set up, yeah? And they're renovating Bedford Tower. So they're renovating this office, and when they go to move the safe into the strong room, the workers pretty sharply discovered that the measurements were all buggered up, right? The safe wouldn't even fit through the doorway. They couldn't get it in the room. Now this left them with a conundrum because they had a safe that couldn't get in the room and a strong room that didn't have a safe. Now it was supposed to hold the crown jewels and a bunch of like manuscripts and other such important and expensive things. So yeah, they're thinking, do we knock down some walls? Do we jump through hoops and go begging and get T's crossed and I's dotted? Just so we can get a smaller safe made. Cover your ears, baby. Why? Because I'm going to say naughty words. Okay, so they say, fuck this for a game of soldiers. They came up with the fantastic decision of keeping the safe in the library. And it would be guarded from the outside. Uh, That's enough, right? That's fine. That's fine. And this was going to be like a temporary solution. Because this was the safe of safes. Nobody was going to break into this, right? Right? She said sarcastically setting up the second part of this heist story. Now Arthur Vickers, he is fastidious. He is pedantic as hell. Now in 1905, Arthur Vickers, he'd written all of these rules and regulations about how the crown jewels had to be kept in a safe, how the safe had to be kept in a strong room, and you know, not in the library. But he never moved the safe. That's right. He kept it in... The library. That's right. He loved the heraldry and inheritance and all that kind of stuff he did. Loved that. Again, wasn't keen on actually guarding the crown jewels. You know, a pretty important part of his job description. And this was, you know, kind of an issue because the library wasn't exactly hidden. It was the waiting room for Arthur Vickers' office. And so... People were coming in and out of there quite a lot, more than they should be for somewhere where you're supposed to be keeping, you know, secure 394 jewels. Like, hmm, so that, 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 that's a lot of shiny rocks to be keeping, you know, relatively out in the open. Um, Yeah, the library also, very accessible, had a bunch of different doors, you know, many ways in, many ways out. And... Not every single one of these doors had a guard. Now, the whole point was they were going to have a sentry guard the door. Which door? Clearly not all the doors. Someone asked Bosco, which door is it? I don't know. That is a very niche joke that only a certain amount of my followers are going to get if they are Irish and old. (laughs) Or at least as old as me. (laughs) So, yeah. When the sentry was guarding the safe, um, he couldn't actually see the safe from his guard post. Like, where he was stationed, he couldn't see it. But yeah, yeah, the, by the time 1907 comes around, there's a bunch of stuff going on. Because it's, it's a busy summer for the Irish government. And Irish aristocracy, which are basically the same thing at this point. They're they're effectively one sort of homogenous mass. They're just glooped together. Which is not too dissimilar to other, you know, ruling nations. <coughs> Cough. Anyway. In May, there was like a World's Fair going on. The Irish International Exhibition. So yeah, from May, and it was supposed to run until November. So that was going on. And this fair was, like, legitimately massive, though. It had, like, two and a half million visitors during 
it sort of run and it had like a Somali village and a Japanese tea garden and other such symbols of, you know, stuff that it had taken from other countries. But anyway. The colonies? Yes. Yes. Actually, you're, you're right. Okay. So, you know, um, British Empire, colonization, you know, I, I mentioned the eradication of languages earlier, but also like to take things from other places and bring it. Sometimes to just show um, quote unquote the exotic other times to just you know mm, other stuff so yeah this fair was running from May we had castle season going on and of course the crown were coming so we had King Edward the Eighth. that's a lie King Edward the Seventh. we have it Edward the Eighth was later on <laughs> He's he's the one who abdicated. Yeah, so King Edward the Seventh, his wife Queen Alexandra, and Princess Victoria. So they were supposed to visit in July, go visit the exhibition, do some sort of royal, you know, duty stuff. And and, and this is a time where remember you've got nationalism and unionism and this this happening, and because of this political conflict and other such controversies that royalty was having to deal with at the time um they very much needed this to be a smooth visit for things to go well spoiler alert they did not four days before the monarchs were due to arrive in ireland the jewels go missing now i might be an anxious overthinker but it does not take you know Agatha Christie to realise that that a series of suspicious events have been happening consecutively, one after another, in a row. On the 28th of June, Arthur Vickers realises his key is missing. The key to the front door of Bedford Tower. You know, where his office is. And, you know, the jewels. So he has to get a guard to let him in. Like, I don't know, five days later, the cleaner, Mrs. Farrell, she notices that the front door is unlocked and she tells the sentry, who then tells Arthur Vickers. And Arthur Vickers, he's like, it's fine. And he does absolutely bugger all. He doesn't go in, he doesn't check the safe, he doesn't question the sentry or the guards or even Mrs. Farrell, the cleaner lady, who at this point I'm convinced is the only sensible person here. And also, weird, suspicious, that this typically, you know, pedantic, incredibly detail-orientated man, who, you know, has a penchant for security as well, didn't think to mention to anybody, or, I don't know, call a locksmith to change the locks, because his key is missing, other stuff's gone wrong, doesn't, doesn't think to maybe organise something, you know? And again... The cleaner, Mrs. Farrell, she seems to be the only person with a head on her shoulders. Or at least the only person who is actively aware of her surroundings. Because three days after that, she's doing the round, she's doing her usual cleaning routine. And what does she discover? But that the outer door of the strong room is unlocked. Bear in mind that the jewels are in the library and not the strong room. But still, right? The outer door of the strong room is unlocked. Now, the inner room to the strong room, it's locked. But, um, the key is still in the door. And it's not exactly inconspicuous, uh, because it's on a key ring with a bunch of other keys just dangling there in the lock of the inner door of the strong room, which is, you know, Meant to be storing a bunch of expensive shit. Did you just say a bad word? Yes. I'm sorry, baby. Please forgive me. I forgive you. Now, the other keys, they're for, like, printing presses and a bunch of other, like, regular office stuff. But that's not the point. Mrs. Farrell, again, being the only one in this entire castle with at least a brain cell, she writes a note for the sentry explaining, you know, the situation, and she leaves the keys for him. So, the sentry, 
reads the note, goes to the strong room, and doesn't find anything odd or peculiar going on. But then he decides to wait for Arthur Vickers to come into work so he can tell him, you know, the situation. Now Vickers, he's he's up to high dough. He's a bit stressed, you know, because the king's coming. And he appears to be so focused on this task that he's none too fussed about some keys ending up in a place they shouldn't have been. And instead of, I don't know, doing anything, he decides to go up the stairs and sit at his desk. So West and Son, the jewellers, they had been working on one of the gold collars for the crown jewels. So they were making some changes to it, you know, fixing it up, whatever. And so they had done that and they were sending it back. So they had a messenger bringing it back so it could be stored in the safe with the rest of the crown jewels. But of course, Arthur Vickers is extremely busy because, you know, the king is arriving in four days. So he gives the keys and the gold collar from Wes and Son over to the sentry and tells him to just go put it in the safe. The safe that is in the weirdly accessible library. So the sentry, he's not nearly half as important as Vickers is, so he just does as he's told. He takes the golden collar, he takes the key, he goes down to the library, he puts his key in the lock, and he tries to turn it. But, uh, it doesn't turn. We all know the rules of righty tidy, lefty Lucy, so he's trying to lock the safe. But this key ain't budging. And so he tries to turn it the other way and pull the handle. But when he does that, he can't open the safe. And he very quickly realises that at the very least, for the entire morning, that safe had been unlocked. Naturally, the fella panics and runs up to tell Arthur Vickers that they had a situation on their hands. The two men rush from Vicar's office into the library and open the safe. And inside, whoosh, basically empty. Like, nearly every piece of jewellery is gone. We are talking every single one of the gold collars worn by the Knights of the Order of St. Patrick. They're all missing, you know, minus the one that Weston's son had been working on. A case full of the Mahoney family's jewels, which, like, Vickers was actually related to by his mum or something. And, of course, the Irish crown jewels. All bloody missing. No, that, that's a lie. That's a bare-faced lie. They left a ribbon. That's, that's something. The ribbon was still in its box in the safe. So the jewels and, like, the badge part, it was attached to the ribbon by this small hook. Now, you could sort of pull it off if you really wanted to, but it was actually unscrewed. Like, whoever did this took their time. They very, very carefully unscrewed it and took the badge off. On top of that, all of the cloth and the tissue paper and other such garmentry which, you know, wrapped the jewels and whatnot, they were carefully folded and placed back in their boxes. Like, this was meticulous. This was careful. This was not, you know, go in, swipe it, get the heck out of Dodge. Like, this was, I mean, patient. Whoever did this took their time. Now, remember, this is in Dublin Castle, where the Dublin Metropolitan Police are stationed. So it didn't take very long for the police to arrive. And so they start their investigation. So they check the front door of the tower, they check the strong room, and they check the safe. And they notice that all of the doors to these haven't been forced. Um, there is no scratches on them or markings that would indicate... Um, you know, a very quickly copied key, you know, and it would have taken a decent amount of time to make, you know, copies, especially during this time, because it's the early 1900s. So there are two options right now. Either, you know, a very 
a very good locksmith had fashioned some professional keys, or someone had taken the original keys. So Bedford Tower has seven keys to the front door. So you've got the sentry, you've got Arthur Vickers, you've got Mrs. Farrell the cleaner, and then like just a couple of other people who work for the Ulster Office of Arms, right? Or the office of the arms, I should say. Then of course we've got the inner keys. So we've got four keys to the outer door of the strong room. And then the inner door of the strong room has two keys. And then the safe had two keys. And all the keys, they're identical. Well, not they're identical. All keys in each set are identical. Like nobody has like a different key, you know. So the four outer keys, that's Sentry, Vickers, Pierce Gun Mahoney, which I'm telling you because it's just a cool name, and that's um, Arthur Vickers' nephew and assistant. And then there's the secretary. But like the secretary's keys were actually in the strong room, so kind of rolled them out. Now the inner strong room keys, one was kept in Arthur Vickers' office, like so up the stairs, in there nice and safe. And then the other key was kept in the door. The inner door of the supposedly secure strong room. They just left the key in the door. And they would only take it out whenever the sentry left his post. And and, and this, this baffles me because what they would do is they would leave it in a drawer near the strong room just in case anybody needed to access it, like other members of staff. Which just, I mean, that's that's bad enough. That's a bad security measure, if ever there was them. I mean, that being said, the safe wasn't in the strong room, but I feel like somewhere where you're keeping, you know, priceless manuscripts should not be that accessible. So that's the information the Dublin Metropolitan Police managed to ascertain. Now, uh, again, the king is supposed to be visiting in four days. Naturally, he is a little bit miffed. And by a little bit miffed, I mean absolutely livid. And so he sends in the big guns, Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard come in, bringing with them Inspector John Kane, who is absolutely convinced this is an inside job. So John Kane presents his report to the Dublin police, who just keep rejecting it. They're like, no, definitely an inside job. You're wrong. You know, we wouldn't let that happen. And so they just reject it. And no one ever sees the report again. It does not reach the light of day. We have no idea what he thought it was. And John Kane and his team get sent back to Scotland Yard. Now, of course, Arthur Vickers himself, he is adamant that absolutely none of his staff would do such a thing. They would not steal the crown jewels, which at this point are being called the crown jewels by the newspapers and the general public. And there's a reward as well. And he's convinced somebody's going to come forward because it's like a thousand pound reward, which I don't know, is like 160, 170 grand in today's money. That's quite a bit. I mean, people do send in tips like people do when there's a reward on offer. But shockingly enough, these tips go nowhere. They even get this tip from like this chick who's saying she's having visions of them being buried in a cemetery. And so Arthur Vickers makes a point of going to two separate cemeteries, digging up around some tombs, and shockingly enough, not finding the crown jewels. This did not do much for his reputation, by the way. Things weren't so bad for Arthur Vickers, though, because he did have several assistants. He had three of them. So, I mean, how to put this, it's, it's like an internship, except you get, like, a big fancy title and power. Because you don't get paid uh, but you do get a bunch of stuff so he has three assistants Francis Shackleton Pierce Gunn Mahoney 
and Francis Bennett Goldney. Now, these are these are three interesting fellas. So Francis Shackleton, and you're thinking that's not a common name, and that sounds yeah, that's the brother of Ernest Shackleton, you know, the world famous explorer. So yeah, he's doing well. His brother's a big celebrity, and also. He's very charming and handsome and he was a ladies man, man's man, man about town and he was known as a party boy. So he spent most of his time in London but he did come to Dublin sort of here and there and when he did come he would stay with Arthur Vickers at his house. And like he was only there like one month a year but still got to be an assistant and just... Just somehow, for some reason, for some way, Francis Shackleton pays half of Arthur Vicker's bills. So like his rent, his, I don't know, fuel bill. It's, it's, why? I mean, because he happened to be rich and like to get, you know, titles and other such heraldry. Like, what is that about? Now... <laughs> I love the fact that I called him a ladies' man. Uh, it's a habit. It's from the movie Down With Love, where he's known as a ladies' man. He's not. He's a man's man. Man's man. Because uh, Shackleton was something that was illegal in Ireland at the time. Um, he was a homosexual. And nobody, nobody, well, Vickers didn't care because he was paying his bills. No. You can get away with most stuff at that time if you're very, very rich and you don't cause issues to the right kind of people. And so Francis was pretty lucky. Then, of course, we have the guy with a really cool name, Pierce Gunn Mahoney. So he's Arthur Vickers' nephew because he's the son of his half-brother. So the Mahoney's, that was their sort of box of family jewels that was in the safe. So they are very, very rich and uh, fairly high up in Dublin society. Now, he would spend most of his time in England, but shockingly enough, still spent more time working for the Office of Arms more than Shackleton did. You know, he was, he was there slightly more. And then we come to mystery drawer number three, Francis Bennett Goldney. He was an antiquarian and he... He was from a line of antiquity scholars, which made him, you know, very rich. Because he had this massive collection of just old stuff, rich stuff, you know, antiquities. So he, he he's one of the people that shoots from the hip because he just straight up asks Arthur for like a job. And he's like, I want to work for you because I want more lofty titles. And he's like, cool. Because you have lots of aristocratic connections. So yeah, yeah, it's fine. So, you know, Arthur Vickers is only interested in like antiques and whatnot. If it helps him find out information about, you know, family trees and other such heraldry. And Bennett Goldney would actually only be sworn into his position two months before the theft occurred. And he also had a secret, a secret that no one would discover until he passed away. Anyway, back to the story. After, you know, the heist and or massive theft, the king is well pissed. And he is straight up demanding that Arthur Vickers resign. He's like, give up your job, you know, resign as Ulster King of Arms. And Arthur Vickers is like, no, because as far as he was concerned, he hadn't done anything wrong. The real people to blame were the Board of Works, because they are the ones who had a safe that was too big for the doorway because they didn't get the measurements right. He wanted to defend himself. He did. He did want to defend himself. He wanted to be able to stand up and tell his story, you know, as publicly as physically possible, because he wanted a big show and tell. And so he asks for a royal commission, and uh, this was promptly denied. Instead, he gets this absolute mockery of a trial, right? It's a vice-regal commission trial, 
which doesn't have any witnesses, there's no press, there's no members of the public, and yeah, yeah, it it's not based around the investigation itself, but about how Arthur Vickers performed his duties. And so when they hear this, when they get this information, Arthur Vickers and his lawyers straight up get up and walk out. Like, they say nothing. They just up and leave. And so, because he's not there to defend himself or provide any information, the commission basically says that he failed in his job. Like, he didn't do it right. Because of the rules and regulations, the stipulations that he had written out in 1905, which stated that the safe must be kept in the strong room, and instead the safe was kept in a library, Arthur Vickers had been delinquent in his duties and, you know, hadn't done the right thing. Even though it wasn't his fault that the safe didn't fit. So he is fired. But here's the thing. Mahoney, you know, the nephew, was all about defending Arthur Vickers. And so he's contacting members of parliament and he's trying to get people to get on board and to, you know, fix this. But they're refusing to help. And when he asks them why, it's because he is, you know, consorting with people of undesirable character. Basically, they were referring to Francis Shackleton and the circle of known homosexuals in society at the time. That being said, higher ranking members of parliament, people in high society are working very hard to make this story just kind of go under the rug. The first thing they do is offer Arthur Vickers a full pension, which is weird for somebody they just fired for negligence. Because yeah, that math ain't mathin. And a lot of pressure was put on the press to make sure they didn't mention anything about a sex scandal within the Irish government, not even hint at it. It's almost as if, uh, you know, there was a member of royalty involved, like the Duke of Argyll, the king's brother-in-law. Basically, there was rumours circulating that at Bedford Tower, they were having special parties. And by special parties, I mean orgies, which I am saying in that way, so that little ears do not repeat them. But yeah, as it turns out, uh, those special parties weren't special parties at all, because... Arthur Vickers is an absolute lightweight, like he cannot handle his booze. And instead of there being big gay soirees, it was like frat boys together and they were just pranking each other. Or, you know, pranking Vickers because, again, first one down, you know. So, Arthur Vickers, he gets so incredibly sloshed. I don't know, because he's one and a half gins in or something. And he passes out. So he's in his office and he is down. Now, apparently, this was a common occurrence. Like, he would often have a couple drinks and then just be just zonked in his office. So what they do is his pals, they go through his clothes, you know, his drinking buddies, and they find his keys. They go downstairs, open the safe, take out the crown jewels, go back upstairs and then put the keys back. Then his buddy or pals posted the jewels back to him. So he gets a wee surprise and he's like, oh great, these have happened. And so he brings them back and puts them back in the safe, right? So this might explain why, you know, for the first wee while, the Vickers isn't that Arthur Vickers isn't too fussed about things going missing or why he expected the jewels to just show up after a couple days. Because, you know, this had already happened. It was probably just another prank. But the jewels were never returned and they have not been seen since. Anywhere in existence in the world. But of course, there are some theories which I know you're dying to hear about. So the first theory is about... Lord Aberdeen. So Aberdeen is a nationalist and he's trying to get home rule. He's an advocate for it. And of course the Unionists, the pro-British people, 
want to embarrass him. Because, uh, you know, they don't want Ireland to be ruled by itself. They don't want to lose power or control or money. And, uh, I mean, here's the thing. The majority of the public in Ireland, Catholic. And the ruling elite, Protestant. So, of course, they want to maintain what power they have. Yeah? So, when they will have to deal with Aberdeen, and they hatch a plan. They decide they're going to steal the crown jewels. And they do this so that they can get him dismissed. Oh, I should mention, uh, Mahoney is Lord Aberdeen. Like, that's him. Uh, unfortunately, this doesn't work because he's not blamed and he doesn't lose his position. So, yeah. Theory number two involves Francis Shackleton. So, he plans the theft because, you know, he's always swanning about flashing his cash, but he's not doing too well financially. He's got an expensive lifestyle and he owes Mulla to his pals. Like, in 1907, he ends up having to testify that he had to borrow money from loan sharks because of how broke he is. And he knows how to get access to the jewels. So, Shackleton one night, one of the drunken knights, gets a hold of Arthur's keys. He gets professional copy made, because he can get them. Maybe at a drinking party, you know, or maybe at Vicar's house, that he pays for. So he gets them, and uh, he goes away. He makes a point of being seen in London, or wherever the hell he was, in order to have an alibi. And then he gets one of his undesirable, whatever, dudes, his lover or whatever, to go in and actually do the thievery, right? And he wants it to look like a big, proper, scary theft, um, but th it doesn't work out that way because, because of course it doesn't. Like, they couldn't organise a piss up in a brewery. Like, no. Nah. So yeah, it's all to do with, like, all this, and then Shackleton takes the jewels, he pops them apart, and, like, he just starts selling them all over Europe, where no one would know what they are. And, like, this is a theory that many believe was actually part of John Cain's official report, um, because it would have included people like the Duke of Argyle, the king's brother-in-law, they think that this is how it was suppressed. Now, there's another theory involving Shackleton, where he didn't do it because... You know, he was broke. He did it because he was being blackmailed because he was gay. So, although, you know, although his sexuality was known within society, or, you know, polite society, it was, you know, it was brushed under the rug. It was ignored. You know, people looked to the side. But, as the theory goes, he was being blackmailed to prevent, you know, the scandalous information from hitting the newspapers. You know, and so he had to go break in, steal the jewels. He manages to get access to Arthur Vicar's keys, gets them copied, and then, you know, hopes for silence. But here's the thing, blackmailers rarely stop at one. They want to keep getting it. So I don't really hold this one particularly true. Theory number four revolves around Irish nationalists who orchestrated the crime in order to embarrass the king and to basically insult British rule, which would promote Irish nationalism somehow. Now remember our antiquarian Bennett Goldney? This is theory number five, and this is his secret. Turns out Bennett Goldney was a thief. Something that didn't come out about him until after he passed away. So naturally, being a collector of antiquities and being from, you know, generations of them, a lot of stuff was getting sorted and arranged to be auctioned. And as they're going through all the stuff that's to be auctioned off, they discover ancient manuscripts from Canterbury. Like, of all the things to hoard, like, mm, I must have the old things. Like, that's, that's an obsession, mate. 
So on top of that, you've got like paintings, manuscripts, and, you know, a few other pieces, which, you know, ethically and legally did not belong to him. And so then the theory goes that Bennett Goldney, you know, has access to the key and either by himself or in association with Shackleton or one of the other men, the sentry perhaps, he plans the heist and arranges an alibi. He gets the jewels, he travels to Europe and then fences them. But as I said before, the jewels were never discovered. They were never seen after this. So they could be somewhere in the Irish countryside or, I don't know, mainland Europe or anywhere right now. And so ends the story of the Irish Crown Jewels. If you liked my retelling of this very peculiar heist with an unsatisfactory ending, feel free to rate and review five stars. Of course, you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, whatever Twitter is known as now. I don't know. Just a squiggle and a dot at this point, probably. And yeah, it is recommendation time. Hey, do you want to give a recommendation for people to to watch or listen or read? What does that mean? A recommendation is when you suggest to someone something like, um, like I can recommend a movie to watch or a TV show or a book to read. What book to read? What book do you think people should read? Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You heard it here first. She said, well, in that case, we should recommend they go watch the new Wonka film that's out. And we, one day we can show you um the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory book. We can read it to you, maybe. Maybe we could do that. Maybe we could. And for listening, I am going to recommend, again, my friend, actually, Kraken's Cabin Podcast. And with that, we are going to bid you good night. Adios, au revoir, au revoir, my friends. Bye-bye.